For decades, film industries went far beyond Hollywood and Japan with vibrant communities in Germany, India, Australia, and Mexico. But gaming's recent birth kept its creators in America, England, and Japan almost exclusively. Thanks to gaming's growth, internet availability, and international markets, development and publishing has evolved over the last 20 years, leading to companies being formed all over the globe. One country that spawned multiple development studios was Ukraine, with the most influential being GSC Game World. The company was easily the country's most successful compared to the likes of Frogwares, Action Forms, and Bestway, with its RTS franchise, Kozex, earning millions in profit and 140 people working on an FPS Oblivion Lost that within one trip to Chernobyl's exclusion zone became Stalker. But after a tumultuous development cycle of five plus years with a comically low salary to all but the most vital members of staff, the game we know today is Shadow of Chernobyl, left behind a story that disgusts the man who told it to this day. Andrew Prokhorov, Stalker's lead designer, describes this 140 plus staff company having just four vehicles in its parking lot. A BMW X5, Porsche Cayenne, and Ferrari F430 owned by the company's CEO, and a second-hand beater belonging to a single programmer. Tired of slaving to serve their leader, Andrew and two co-workers left to form their own studio, one where the priority would not be money, but its people. Four A Games was founded in 2005, a year prior to Stalker's completion and two years before THQ published it in the West. While being the bug-ridden mess Eastern Games had the reputation of being at the time, Stalker was a cult hit, earning many accolades and praise for its open-ended design and depth of gameplay. But there was little regret on the part of Four A's founders upon Stalker's success being followed up with GSC firing its entire art department, who subsequently joined Four A Games shortly after. These early days were equal parts camaraderie and fear. Everyone was as experienced as they were passionate about creating immersive atmospheric games that pushed the boundaries of art and technology, building a strong unity from its inception. But being a self-funded company of less than a dozen people, they needed a publisher and content presentable to said publisher. The inspiration, as it turned out, would be a free novel on the internet. Since the age of 10, Dmitry Glukovsky spent two hours of every day within Russia's metro network, and having seen its architecture, security, and technology over the span of 3,000 hours, he pieced together what the metro truly was, the world's largest nuclear bunker. Realizing the deepest stations were nearly 300 feet underground, with hermetic barriers and airlock sealed entrances that could keep its occupants safe for years. Having read novels like Roadside Picnic and played games like Fallout, Dimitri realized the perfect setting for a post-apocalyptic tale already existed within the very tunnels he traveled through. Having begun writing it during university, he finished it at 18 years of age, taking it to various publishers that repeatedly rejected, with the most common criticism laid at the author's bold choice of killing the book's hero in Act 2. Frustrated and demoralized but wanting people to read his expressive novel, Dimitri made a website and self-published chapters online for free in 2002. And somehow, without any paid promotion, his story quickly gained an audience, eventually leading to six to 7,000 visitors per day and four million total readers, certainly large enough to convince Dimitri that his hero should live to complete their mission. Changes like this created a relationship between Glukovsky and his readers who felt they were building something together, effectively being the largest and most passionate editors an author could receive. Having a crowd of thousands assisting the author in building this wonderful world he created, he kept the story's final chapter offline while publishers were now knocking on his door, desperate to print this local phenomena. It was around this time that Dimitri was contacted by a certain game studio across the border. <laughs> Metro was the perfect setting for 4A's talent, with the team consisting almost entirely of ex-Stalker developers at this point. Most importantly, its lead programmers and artists, the former capable of crafting the tools the latter would use to bring this tunnel network to life. 
and they did at a wicked pace. Announcing the game one year after collaborating with the book's author along with a pre-alpha trailer demonstrating a level that's remarkably similar to the final product, four years prior to its release. And even more sections can be seen in early screenshots and builds playable at the Leipzig Games Convention. Though I'm sure a lot of you have the same thought. This looks a lot like Stalker, and the CEO of GSC thought so too. In fact, by 2009 he accused the company of stealing GSC's X-Ray engine which being that two of 4A's founding members were the men responsible for said engine, was possible. 4A quickly denied these allegations, and not with a one-paragraph note, but explanations for how they had, quote, No relationship. The major obstacles to the future of Stalker Engine were its inherent inability to be multi-threaded, the weak and error-prone networking model, and simply awful resource and memory management, which prohibited any kind of streaming or simply keeping the working set small enough for next-gen consoles. So in our pick-a-side world, who's right? Well, there hasn't been third-party confirmation with either side. GSC never went beyond their accusations, and 4A have never commented on the matter since 2010. The only way someone could delve further into this story is if they had access to the pre-alpha themselves. But that build's not available to the public. So now that I have the build, I can confirm that Olez is right. Metro, even in the pre-alpha, has no relationship to the X-Ray engine used in Stalker. It just uses the same weapon files, meshes, scripts, sounds, shaders, and textures. No relationship. Had GSC Gameworld made their accusations after this pre-alpha trailer dropped, 4A might have been in serious trouble as there's easily enough assets ripped from Stalker to make Olez's statement that the 4A engine merely began as a personal project questionable at best. But GSC didn't, instead making these claims by the times 4A's engine had enough middleware that it resembled X-Ray as much as Titanfall 2 resembles the Source engine. Clearly, there was a lot of turmoil between the two studios, and I think publishing also raises some questions. After THQ published Stalker, Deep Silver picked up the following releases, and THQ announced Metro 2033 in 2009. What caused the switch? Well, Shadow of Chernobyl's development was such a dumpster fire, after GSC uploaded an unprotected build to an FTP leaked by fans, THQ sent producer Dean Sharp over to manhandle the studio into getting the damn thing shipped. Dean recalled with Eurogamer having to throw someone out of his office for trying to do the same to him, yelling, quote, You can go fuck yourselves and fix your own fucking game! Yeah! And calmly told the CEO, quote, you! You're not gonna get paid anymore unless you finish it! It was a nightmare of cut content, online death threats, and mutual resentment. But Dean ultimately won with Stalker being ready for release by 2007. And with one last show to do before heading back home to California, he heard about another game made by former developers of the studio he whipped across the finish line. Out of curiosity, he checked their demo and immediately rushed back to the THQ booth, telling his friend Kelly Flock what he saw. The conversation that saved 4A games from bankruptcy went as follows. And I'm sure these words were repeated by Dean when he saw Metro's design doc, because it's hardly modest. Originally titled Metro's Nightmare World releasing for PC and the Xbox 2, it is the opposite of what 4A demoed in their pre-alpha build. It was written to have non-scripted AI, RPG elements, strong replayability, a 20-hour campaign, multiplayer, third-person camera, full-day night cycle, add-ons, and sequels taking place in Paris, London, or Prague with plans to expand Metro into an MMO. I am not making this up. It's really a fascinating read, with my favorite cut feature being rat races, where you'd supposedly control a rat through tunnel labyrinths to come out first. Just like how the original Mass Effect document sounds like a turbo take of Andromeda, Metro's document makes Exodus look relatively reserved. But considering THQ's poor experience with Stalker and the team's own influences consisting of linear experiences, it's not surprising that the Metro eventually released in March 2010 dropped many concepts. In the early 2000s, foreign independents like GSC Gameworld couldn't grab attention with sophisticated graphics, high production value, or celebrities in or outside the gaming industry, effectively forcing the studio to willingly overhype their projects for attention. But 4A Games and Metro were meant to change that. 
The developers were no longer made up of inexperienced dreamers, but veteran developers who knew exactly what the issues with their technology were, and what needed to be done in order to resolve them. This was meant to be the moment when the East could make not a niche game only for the most hardcore players, but a AAA title that could rival the quality of the games that inspired it. I've been making years later videos for a while now and have since developed an unintended constant that's going to change this year. Each game analyzed is one that I've enjoyed. Some admittedly more than others, but there hasn't been a title I genuinely disliked. Which is why I was apprehensive about covering the Metro series, because Metro 2033 was a game that I had problems with to say the least. Let it be written that the turbo-linear bombastic campaigns of 2010 were right up my alley as a teenager. Even critically panned titles like Medal of Honor with its appallingly scripted levels weren't enough to stop me throwing out high review scores like candy. But Metro… was too much. The environment lent itself to a linear campaign, and I wouldn't dare criticize its usage of cramped hallways considering the fiction. But the amount of time spent behind lifeless NPCs is just appalling. Let's go. Be careful here. This is a dangerous tunnel. Freeze. Concentrate. Let's go. Move aside, Artyom. Let's go. Freeze. Follow me, but remain at my back. Let's go. Let's go. Don't move. Ramirez! This was the level that made me quit. Over an hour into the game had passed, and for only one stage did it leave me to my own devices. The rest of the experience was spent trapped behind NPCs, vapid scripted set pieces, horrendous stealth, and invisible walls. In both recent playthroughs I did for this video, Khan's introduction put me to sleep by the sheer lack of control, tension, interest, or even need for my existence. This was on Hardcore Ranger difficulty. But having mentioned two playthroughs, it's clear I progressed much further than the first two hours, because even though my initial bias weighed very much against this game's favor, I powered through promising an open mind. And now... I like it. But everything listed earlier is present, and then some. Honestly, the bulk of this game's pacing issues in regards to its infuriating NPCs, invisible walls, and scripted moments wouldn't be so bad if they just allowed the player to perform basic tasks. NPCs could still lead new players caught up in the tense atmosphere, while letting those several steps ahead of companions progress rather than forced to watch someone else move boxes. I've said this before, but NPCs are best as something for players to fall back on, or assistants, rather than leaders. Having 20 to 40 seconds may not sound like much, but when these moments pile together, it quickly adds up. Especially when the player has quite literally nothing to do. There's no physics to play with, no secrets to find, no way to jump on a character's head. Until your ally shows up, you can't progress. And yes, this was hardly an issue isolated to Metro, but I'd argue even amongst the slew of mediocre shooter campaigns released at that time, 2033 is one of the worst offenders in how it treats the player. Yet, what adds to the frustration is how much it respects said player in other areas. The game's King Kong inspiration can be seen not just in one cutscene, but gameplay. The design doc cites Ubisoft's license gem for Metro's minimal display, and one of the few things making its way to the final product. There's crosshairs, icons, and displays on normal, and in Ranger you can still bring up ammo counters, but the commitment to immersion is overt, right down to objectives being on your notepad within the game's world rather than an abstract screen. I love this. And while the game's objective placement occasionally confuses in its more open-ended sections, they're hardly labyrinths, and mostly come down to finding the one path whose purpose is to lead to the next checkpoint. Unfortunately, these can also highlight the game's clunkiness. For instance, in my second playthrough, I remember this hole in Chapter 5 is where you're supposed to go. But RT impacted in too many calories to fit through, leaving me chased by monsters not worth the ammo required to put them down, losing my mind due to how much I could have sworn that broken wall was the correct path only for desperation to elicit another attempt where Artyom managed to sweat a pound off and squeeze through. Frankly, that's the most dated thing about 4A's debut engine. Artyom not only feels like a fridge on skis, but one with magnets attached, because he'll randomly get stuck on almost anything. There's no collision or adjustment to your movement speed when brushing up against a wall or railing. You just come to a halt. And considering the game's setting, it's hardly a rarity. This definitely isn't a game for those who want something jank-free in movement, aiming, or shooting. But that's in function. In appearance, ignoring the engine's upgrade three years later, 2033 is still a great-looking game. 
Bland character models, poor environment textures, and stiff animations register, but the weapons, lighting, and sheer attention to detail is staggering. Stalker might have been an atmospheric game, but its gritty textures and environment aren't exactly an artistic achievement. After all, Metro's pre-alpha managed to look almost exactly like it in a matter of months. You can tell the art department formerly of GSC really stretched their muscles here. The bastard and semi-auto shotgun alone gave Metro a distinct style not aligned with any other post-apocalyptic game. 4A knew Glukowski's fiction had never been realized in a visual medium, encouraging them to make the absolute most of it with distinct stations, various factions, and fiercely packed markets. From people selling clothes, food, and weapons, to musicians playing for crowds, farmers raising pigs, and children running around, the world itself is without a doubt Metro 2033's strongest aspect. Where so many games forego details like what do people eat, how do their governments function, and what the exact layout is, Metro uses all of those to give context to your adventure. Considering the setting, natural linearity, and repetition of its tunnels, Metro would theoretically age as poorly as the rest of the gritty pseudo-realistic shooters of that time, but the deep shadows and decorated subsections bathe the game's levels in light that can be as depressing as it is touching. RTM's journey through the Metro tunnels itself gives the player a vast array of cultures, people, governments, and environments to experience, steadily building atop each other per level. RTM's dark and desolate home makes Pola's station something to admire in its scale, peace, and beautiful architecture, which is then contrasted with the highly technical and modern technology of D6 that forces our hero to go from the lowest station to the highest tower in Moscow. By the end, you felt this journey as much as you've played it, and this is something accomplished by many of the greats in this art form, and 4A should be proud for having done it in their debut title. I just wish the game itself was better executed. The visual presentation and overall progression of the campaign is great, but sound design... Yeah, as someone tilted by stock sound effects, Metro's moments can often be quite difficult to take seriously. The boss? But of course! Then to the boss it is! Where else would you like to go? Okay, that's enough! Part of me wants to give 4A a break as they were made up of a couple dozen people working around the clock in an office that wouldn't look out of place in Stalker, but when other independent studios like New World Interactive were able to have some of the best weapon effects in an FPS, I'm less forgiving. In terms of level design, the peaks are its most open-ended missions in both the metro and outdoors, though the former highlights the game's appalling stealth mechanics where one missed throwing knife puts the entire system on high alert. So exploring the wasteland is just that bit more enjoyable, if unremarkable though there's plenty of trash to wade through along the way. I already mentioned Khan's dominance, but there's rescuing a child who messes with your controls so poorly some thought their game was glitched, obnoxious shooting galleries, and an escort mission with kamikaze enemies, because someone at 4A hates people and wants us to suffer. In terms of voice acting, it's kind of fascinating. The translation's mostly forgettable and characters rarely show inflection in their voice, yet Last Light has the same bulk of voice actors and that game's dubbing is notably superior, which will be discussed in greater detail. For now, I believe 2033's bland performances come down to three key factors, most notably, the writing. Look, Russian ain't a language that converts to English easily, and translators basically need to be professional authors themselves if they want what's read to be engrossing. But the result here is the only characters I liked were Allman and Danila, because they're the ones that have more emotion than these videos. Which leads to the second point, direction. It can't be the actor's fault because nearly everyone's like this, I heard you received no help from Polis. What's your next move? Our team himself is someone I'm conflicted about, because on the one hand, he's the blandest of them all, only adjusting his tone after the most dramatic scenes. Han assured me that Bourbon's fate was not tied to my own, but I regretted his death. But I quite like his youthful delivery. It really sells the character as a young citizen rather than a warrior, whereas his Russian counterpart sounds more like what you'd expect from Miller. После нашего боя с фашистскими дрезинами, нам казалось, что впереди нас уже не ждет ничего страшного. Какая ошибка. Don't get me wrong though, the game's original performances are far superior to the dub, even for those who are forced to read subtitles like me. Because while Russian and English are such different languages the subtitles aren't exactly in sync with the character's speech, the actor's direction is good enough to carry you through that. This, I believe, is the best example of how much a difference good direction makes. It's hard to describe my feelings at that moment. Exhausted, yes, but joyful. I had made it. Я подал с ног от усталости и в то же время не мог сдержать улыбки. Я справился. Я доставил послание Хантера в полис, и теперь судьба моей станции была в руках куда более сильных, чем мои собственные. Я выполнил свою миссию. 
I may not be able to understand what he said, but I can register his excitement and relief instinctively. Subtitles are more than worth it if it's easier to connect with the characters. The only problem is Khan's Russian voice actor eating the microphone. There's also an issue languages can't resolve in regards to storytelling, those being the cutscenes. Mostly the game follows Half-Life's rule of keeping players firmly in the eyes of the character, but on occasion it'll switch to a cinematic angle, particularly in dialogue scenes. And my last years later, Andromeda had an interesting error where frames were frozen for a moment with most cuts. But today, I've discovered something even more bizarre. I immediately picked up on something being off about this game's cuts, almost like it's animating movement between takes. And that's not far off. When slowing down the footage, you can see the camera being moved from one angle to the other in just a couple of frames, attempting to be instantaneous, but failing. The only reason I could possibly see for why this would be is the game's engine can't have multiple cameras at once. Turns out, there's other scenes that do cut immediately. So until this is confirmed by the developers themselves, the bizarre editing will remain a mystery. But none of these things prevent the game from doing an absolutely phenomenal job of realizing the world Dimitri put to the page. Though this raises the question of not just storytelling, but the story itself. Concessions and changes were inevitable, and 4A were lucky to have a novelist who respected this art form <coughs> and willingly assisted the team wherever possible, even going as far as rewriting all of the game's Russian dialogue. But I have a bit of beef with this game's plot, and it's in many ways a repeat of my criticism with ODST. RTM doesn't really do a whole lot. Hear me out. You kill lots of things, navigate dangerous landscapes, and communicate with important characters. But why does our team do all of this? The novel establishes his reason beyond mere survival instinct. Having left the exit, Dark Ones are coming through unsealed as a child. It immediately shows our hero's personal involvement as he feels responsible for all of the death in his home, and somewhat explains the Dark Ones' attempts to communicate with him. But the game lacks this context, only establishing Hunter's disappearance and Artyom promising to see his mission through. In a novel, giving the hero a simple goal is easier because you have the benefit of reading exactly what the character is thinking, feeling, and doing on each page, developing who they are. But because Artyom is a silent protagonist in the game except for loading screens, and a good chunk is spent following cardboard cutouts, the game doesn't share that development. Whether it was due to cut content, commitment to a silent protagonist, or something else can only be speculated. But the result is Artyom has too much character to serve as a vessel for the player, but not enough to make him necessary as a protagonist. There are absolutely memorable sequences in this game, from our team's desperate search for the D6 codes, crushing a giant biomass, and what feels like 4A's tribute to Resident Evil, there's just not a lot of depth to them, which is disappointing in a world as rich and fascinating as Metro's. Similar to the game's opening, its conclusion also has an alteration small in scale, but grand in effect. The tragedy of Metro's novel in the conclusion is that Artyom makes contact with the Dark Ones, realizing his nightmares and visions were their attempts to communicate with him, just as the missiles sent to destroy them are about to land. But the game doesn't do this. Artyom sets the target designator by default, travels through a bizarre vision caused by the Dark Ones, and watches their world burn while pondering he perhaps made a mistake. It lacks the power and catastrophe of Dimitri's message, and for a reason I don't believe was worth it. Throughout the game, there's an invisible karma meter that, when filled, grants the option of an alternate ending. These moral points can be earned by talking to people lining up for the hospital, giving a bullet to a beggar, or playing the guitar in your room. One of the contributions to saving an entire race from total annihilation is playing a guitar. While it's something that's easy to mock, the truth is, even with more reasonable explanations, it feels like Dimitri's originally tragic ending has been chopped up into two extremes absolute death and absolute understanding, where the point of the novel is that our team understood when it was too late, and that's what makes the conclusion devastating. By attempting to utilize the unique medium of games for storytelling in this area, it ultimately ends the game on a lukewarm note regardless of which ending is selected, and in spite of the appreciation for our journey from the deepest tunnels to the highest views. But while the credits rolled, I felt that I finally understood this game. For reasons you'll find out, Metro 2033 seemed undesirable to me, existing only as a testing ground for what 4A was truly capable of. But having given it the benefit of the doubt, it's shown how much 4A managed to accomplish in their first game. Few in history have managed to present a world as passionately and dedicated as this small team in Ukraine running off of purely their own technology. Almost. Most adaptations are made as a mutually profitable venture, but it's immediately apparent that wasn't the case with Metro 2033. 
It was a creation made out of mutual respect between the author's creativity and the developer's ability to realize it. And while there's much of this game that I still find infuriating, irrespective of the circumstances, Metro 2033 absolutely paved the way for what this series could do, and continued to. THQ's Vice President Danny Bilson had greenlit a sequel before Metro 2033 was released. When explaining his reasoning, he simply stated, I know what 4A Games is capable of. I knew how cool it was. The bulk of my criticisms wouldn't surprise the developers as from the outset of Last Light's reveal, both 4A and THQ acknowledged them, promising repeatedly that its sequel would be made much, much better. And while 4A weren't going to repeat the original design docs' ambition, they set sights on enhancing and expanding every element with the confidence of 4A being not just a team, but a family. Bigger levels, refined combat and stealth, a more personal story, AAA presentation, intense multiplayer matches, and complete multi-platform releases, including the Wii U. Even prior to the revealed trailer in May 2011, THQ's VP was adamant about allocating more resources to the studio, being that 2033 was the cheapest game they released in 2010 and should have received a bigger marketing push. Despite THQ's struggles due in large part to another first-person shooter with the opposite budgetary issue, they did exactly that, producing trailers edited to the somber beats of Portishead, big E3 presentations, and even a compelling short film. As the game was greenlit in early 2010, Dmitry Glukovsky got to work writing the story and dialogue. His second novel, Metro 2034, was successful, but didn't lend itself as a video game, following three separate characters in their own adventures while the developers wanted a direct sequel, and Dmitry granted their wish. Having increased fidelity tenfold, tightened its gameplay, and addressed the concerns of fans and detractors, Last Light seemed to be a textbook sequel with an equally smooth development. But in May of 2013, just weeks after Last Light had launched, THQ's former executive told a very different story. Jason Rubin's most famous for having founded Naughty Dog, but after THQ's Danny Bilson left the company during its implosion, Jason attempted to repair the ship. It proved to be futile, and ultimately THQ spent its final days selling franchises to publishers, but with the company in ruins and everyone being forced to move on, it gave license for Jason to personally credit Foray overcoming a maddening development cycle. Stating that Foray was never given an equal playing field to the likes of EA and Activision, with a budget 10% of what these companies traditionally fund with more engineers than Foray's entire staff. In the developer's 10-year history with THQ between Stalker and Metro, Jason was said by Last Light's creative director to be the first company president to ever visit the studio in Ukraine, to which he was appalled by the studio's cramped state with office chairs that would be unacceptable in a doctor's lounge. Upon leaving, Jason wanted to give the studio at least office chairs considered a fundamental right in the West, but with no outlets in Ukraine, the only option was to pack a Polish delivery truck with an expediter to bribe their way to Kiev. The best part is, this wasn't even ultimately accomplished, because larger chairs required bigger desks that couldn't fit into 4A's headquarters. When 4A needed dev kits or a high-end PC, someone from the company would have to travel to the States and sneak the kit across borders in a backpack so it wouldn't be seized by thieving customs officials. Not even consistent power was something Ukrainians had access to, lacking electricity for hours or days during development, often forcing them to bring construction generators and work weekends to hit their milestones. Luckily, heating in Kiev is handled separately by the government, so they don't have to freeze. <laughs> Just kidding. The central coal burning facility regularly broke down, forcing employees to wear parkas in the office. The only thing for which Foray is getting more credit than I think they deserve is the creativity behind the ever frightening, dark, post apocalyptic environment of the game. I've been in Kiev to visit the team, so I know they just stepped outside for reference. Quotes like these are admitted by Jason to be a humorous exaggeration, but considering our old friend Dean Sharp was kicked out of his apartment by an armed entourage, it's not as slight as one may think. It's challenges like these that inevitably led to 4A cutting features in order to focus their title. Already straining resources to port the game to PlayStation 3, which 2033 failed to make, a Wii U port with its inferior CPU was scrapped, as was multiplayer which never managed to progress beyond prototyping, and co-op. Both features said by Rubin were demands by THQ's original producers. Jason compared 4A games to the Jamaican bobsleigh team in 1994, who hadn't achieved gold but beat the Americans that had far greater resources, like winter coats and bobsleigh courses to practice on, congratulating 4A's success as a quote, stunning achievement. 
Admirably, Foray's creative director, despite the difficulty of development, said in response, quote, We deserve the ratings we get. After all, the final consumer doesn't care about our conditions. And this is right. We need no indulgence. I honestly had no intentions of playing Last Light given my frustration with 2033 at the time, but having acquired a GTX 660, it came with a code to try out, where I immediately noted the difference in how the game felt pulling the trigger. This wasn't stereotypical mid-market eastern jank, it felt as elegant as the most popular western shooters. Within one fell swoop the game no longer fell back on its authentic world, but made it compelling whether I was walking through markets or mowing down enemies. Things seemed to get better upon realizing that when missing a throwing knife, the entire metro wouldn't spontaneously discern RTM's coordinates, and a bulk of the adventure was spent cutting up guards. Now the story involved RTM personally from the opening cutscene. The second ally met had personality, and the game's graphics went from being promising to an absolute technical marvel. Within a single game, 4A went from angering my younger self to keeping me glued to the screen. From the prologue, it never let go. Except for that romance and fever dream. Last Light was one of those games I fell completely in love with. And it's a moment I remember fondly today. But that's the past, and Last Light's come to contrast 2033 quite effectively. Don't worry, the game's still good in my eyes. Great in some parts. But having come to appreciate the original now, gripes certain hardcore fans had with this sequel make sense to me now. Firstly, while the game feels much better to play, coming directly off of 2033, it also immediately feels less authentic. Reloads are visibly sped up, as are battery charges, recoils minimal, ammo's more plentiful, hit markers confirm your kills, and changes weren't just made to the player. Humans across all difficulties and factions now pause before detecting players, are easily distracted, and no longer pixel peek beyond Diamonds and Siege. While these were all improvements for those who disliked 2033's cumbersome controls and enemy seesawing between stupid and savage, now I look at it this way. Players were empowered at the same time enemies were disempowered. And this has a profound effect on Last Light's gameplay, positively and negatively depending on how it's played. A normal when coasting through the campaign experiencing its mixture of indoor firefights, outdoor survival, and atmospheric trips, Last Light's effortless compared to the original as in there aren't unpolished levels, sporadic AI, or the worst goddamn thing to ever be put to a disc. It's become an accessible game as the franchise from its design doc was meant to be. Combat's bloody in presentation, but quite forgiving in practice. RTM can take tons of punishment, and now carries an extra primary weapon. Meaning that while new players might be pushed to the breaking point, they've got all the support needed to escape dire scenarios. But Hardcore Ranger is when quality of life changes are distinguished from those that genuinely dampen the game's ruthless atmosphere. Some are small, like HUD informing you of when your battery's full. Others directly affect gameplay, like Stealth. Stealth in 2033 was woefully underdesigned, but intentionally or not, the game was less about ghosting levels and more tilting the scales in your favor for when firefights inevitably broke out. Traps were commonplace, shattered glass gave away your position, and even one enemy would be capable of putting you down. But Last Light has fuse boxes that can be disabled, a binary indicator for when you're unseen, and guards that have a slow response time. A very slow response time. Was spotting you in the dark without a whisper infuriating? Resoundingly, yes, but what's just as bad are guards I can get close enough to inspect their helmet textures before detection. And this is further exasperated by the level design. Human encounters are generally made up of levels using a grid layout as it helps players whether they're sneaking or fighting, but with the former, there's often gaps blocked by enemies that you have to wait for. This red light green light trope merely wastes people's time rather than build tension, especially on repeat playthroughs because there's no decisions for the player to make and you have an indicator confirming you're not at risk. Just like waiting for NPCs, there's no participation, inevitably leading some to finally snap, arousing suspicion or setting off alarms, and what you'll quickly find is because Last Light breaks its own levels into sections, actions from previous areas don't carry over. Not loading screens, but one doorway being the difference between chaos and calm. You can mow down everybody in one sector with alarms blaring and grenades shaking the metro walls, only for the next room to reset everything. This is baked into the game's design, Ranger can't resolve it. If anything, problems are made worse because damage is heightened for everyone, but guards still retain their slow reaction times and detection has no consequences beyond the immediate battle you're fighting in. 
What Metro 2033 set up for iteration was something like Payday 2, where stealth's a viable option, but difficult for most players to maintain throughout a level, becoming more about easing the pressure of future firefights. But Last Light's enemies aren't threatening enough, nor are there enough consequences to make stealth effectively blend with the core gameplay. And it's really a shame that Metro never got the modability of Stalker, as I believe this is something which could be tweaked. Redux editions do have two modes, Survival and Spartan. The latter is Last Light's core gameplay, rudimentary stealth and action spectacle, while the former attempts to recreate 2033's brutality but enemy reaction times kill that idea. I feel like Metro's best gameplay is a middle ground between these modes and really wish you could, for instance, disable HUD while showing ammo counts with the watch like in the original. While there's plenty of ways to play both Last Light and 2033 today, not all choices are equal in results, and found it was best to just play whatever the game's design seemed to be aiming for. There's absolutely an appeal in making RTM more of an underdog. The best battles of 2033 required players to plan the most effective routes through environments, desperately hugging the destroyed vehicles for cover and checking every corner. Last Light's gameplay, while more polished, replaces that fight for survival apparent even on normal difficulty and trades it for the mix of stealth and action that's become the standard since Far Cry 3. Wolfenstein's used this formula, as has Battlefield, and multiple third-person games. Where titles like Half-Life 2, for example, have become retroactively unique, time has unkindly made Last Light's mechanics more generic, and because of them, Ranger's modifiers don't resolve that. Which is why Hardcore would be most advised for this game, making enemies more of a threat while still emphasizing Last Light's pacing of an explosive roller coaster. Though not at first. While the story intrigues, I honestly don't know how I enjoyed this game's opening hours, because the hand-holding that crippled 2033's is even worse here. After the third loading screen, players are still locked to a pathway so confined it doesn't even allow you to move left or right and needlessly drags with an NPC blocking your progress. Why does Khan step first? Why does Anna need to climb the ladder? Why does Pavel need to pull on this fence? So it can tutorialize mechanics like the game already does with hints on your screen? The most effective way to strike fear in the hearts of players is to put them against something unknown not introduce them through a guide with sequences that are more difficult to fail than succeed. Because when the game takes off the leash and lets you confront dangers yourself, it's fucking great. Even your lighter, previously used to make objectives easier to read, now serves the extra purpose of burning cobwebs, whose speed decrease might not be important if you weren't in caves with mutated spider scorpions. These side sectors aren't even required to progress, yet I play them every time because they're just so enjoyable. Just like 2033, there is a real sense of adventure. Visiting large varieties of locations in the underground and on the surface with multiple characters, factions, and moments that create this sense of place. The developers didn't need to have multiple shows in a theater, show kids being taught of the old world through hand puppets, or have optional objectives, but it's these things that make Last Light so engrossing. And this is only assisted by 4A's astonishing presentation. It's been more than half a decade since this game was released and it's still state-of-the-art, with multiple landscapes that are just awe-inspiring. From its highly detailed textures, environmental effects, or blood and dirt on gas masks, 4A are proven masters of art and technology, used so effectively to convey Metro's universe. What I absolutely adore and why I believe Metro has such maturity where most with the rating rely on access is how villainous people do exist in this world but they're not omnipresent. You will see Nazis laughing over their supremacy, but also one of their soldiers sobbing in a locked room alone. There's members of the Reds believing in its propaganda of equality and order, while others strive for domination within. It even goes to show someone like Pavel, opposed to the Reich and becomes an antagonist, will still order an enemy to surrender and let them go. Heartless people aren't the default in order to make your objectives unquestionable despite a post-apocalypse giving the perfect excuses for a writer to do so. And that effort is at the core of what makes Metro a special universe. The epic battle between Rangers and Reds would be level 2 or 4 in a traditional FPS, but because Last Light spends time developing the Reds, showing the hopeful to the despicable, the righteous to the reclusive, there's hours of empathy, disgust, and conflict amongst the tanks, miniguns, and shields. With context narratively and through gameplay, it combines to make a wonderfully intense finale that deserves the label of epic. Until the ending itself, with almost an exact repeat of 2033's arbitrary moral points being what earns you a good alternate ending, in which our team survives instead of blown up, which is going to make transitioning between Last Light and Exodus awkward for most. 
Then again, Last Light already prepared us for that, with a touching introduction that's beautifully edited, written, voiced, and scored, but retconned. I was born in Moscow, but I remember nothing of that time. I remember how we took a short escalator to the surface, how we exited a spacious glass pavilion and saw a street buried in green. I remember the small clouds moving across the limitless sky. Remember how in the novel our team admits to Hunter he went to the botanical gardens as a kid and might be responsible for the Dark Ones invading? Well now it's not only been reincorporated, but expanded upon, with our team and friends not only leaving their home, but visiting the surface. And the game goes on to reveal that Artyom met and spoke to a Dark One. Some might believe a character forgetting something this significant, but I can't, and probably wouldn't have been as emotionally touched by this scene in 2013 had I played the original game. I would refrain from bringing this up had Metro 2033's Redux incorporated this revelation, but it doesn't. I was born in Moscow, but I remember nothing of that time. Although, Last Light does heighten our team's role with a very personal tale the moment you start, and only continues. Players fighting through the factions, creatures, and wasteland to redeem their character, while not exactly complex, is a rare tale in gaming, yet lends itself to the medium quite effectively. It's hard to hate someone when you've walked in their shoes, and Last Light uses this to its advantage from the introduction. It helps that not only 4A improved, but also PCB Productions where both games were recorded. Between our team's narration with superior translations and voice acting in English, and personal notes within levels, our hero has a much stronger identity. Despite being a silent protagonist in gameplay, he's not purely a vessel for the player to imprint themselves onto. He very clearly has his own thoughts, feelings, and perspective on the various factions, stations, people, and what's best for the Metro. After finishing this game's Chronicles pack where player characters speak during gameplay, I wish Artyom got similar treatment as based on what's known, he's capable of being a relatable protagonist. He is gone. He did what he could. And now he is gone to meet his kin. I can't judge him for that. The remainders of humanity are finishing each other off in their final fight. It is not his war. I hope he was able to forgive us. Me, for what we did to his brothers and sisters, his mother and father. It comes as no surprise then that the cast this time around is also more charismatic. Mostly. It's odd to have Miller's voice actor be an antagonist now, but he's such a better fit for the likable traitor Pavel, and not merely for his Three Musketeers quote. Pavel's one of the most memorable characters in the story because like Artyom's redemption, Pavel's role of the antagonist is also relatively rare compared to the straight villain. It's something only a few developers have really tapped into and only gets rarer in the shooter genre. While working with a traitor is cliche, having the same person regret fighting you hours after committing to the red line isn't. And just like Metro's world, Pavel's actions, while wrong, are perfectly understandable. Why would one man be able to convert someone who's loyal to their cause for years, if not decades? <coughs> you get the sense that were their lives a bit different, our team and Pavel really would be the comrades they seem to be early on. But the tragedy Metro isn't afraid to show is that the lives they've lived made that opportunity an impossibility. And Pavel serves as easily the most empathetic of the antagonists. But not the only. General Moskvin beats the snot out of you, kills his brother, rails against his son, and has a goddamn Hitler stash, all to reveal the penultimate chapter that he's being manipulated by General Corbett instead. According to the game's fandom page, this wasn't always the case, with earlier versions lacking Corbett's manipulation and putting emphasis on Moskvin's envy of his brother's power and charisma. Not only does the final's adjustment turn this into a red herring, it has the added effect of making Corbett the only antagonist who's completely despicable, and I'd argue it serves to reinforce why Artyom's journey is so important. General Moskvin is someone who similarly made a catastrophic mistake that cannot be reversed. Left to drink himself into a depression might have been something our team would have done had he not meet the baby Dark One. Perhaps a cynic would argue making the last Dark One a child is cheap, but I think there's much more to the character that makes him so endearing. When our team catches up with him by the game's second act and the Dark One's free to escape, he's observing you while proceeding to the railcar's exit the whole time. There's hesitation, but also a curiosity that needs to be satisfied which is why I think the character's quick to forgive Artyom after saving his life. 
Both characters don't need to care for the other, but they do anyways, and that ignites their bond. From there, it's a combination of animations and actions, some of which even connect in gameplay, that make him much more than a simple plot device. It's hard not to smile at him waving to guards while disguised. By all logical means, it's not something an infiltrator would do, but being a child, he's not thinking that way. He just wants to belong, and that's something anyone can relate to on some level. While his gameplay assistance is light with thermal vision on occasions and retrieving filters, something I had plenty of, it helps characterize someone when you're both watching and playing as opposed to one or the other, like some characters. Yeah, we're going to talk about Anna now. I've not spoken to one man or woman that likes this character, and it's not because of her design, voice, or skill set. It's entirely in her writing. While FPS has had notable companions by 2013, when it comes to romance, only the darkness comes to mind, and that was with a pre-established relationship. Aside from that, it's been RPGs and third-person adventures taking up the duty of clickbait. Point being that Anna's concept has lots of potential. Portraying an evolving romance similar to Max Payne 2 or Metal Gear Solid 3 hasn't been done in a first-person shooter, it built on top of our team's motivation to save the Metro, and combined with effective gameplay assistance, their partnership can be sold beyond bedroom scenes. But that last part in our team's narration is about all that's done to tell you these two care for each other. The pacing is just horrendous. From the opening chapter, she's using her only insult for Artyom per paragraph, isn't seen for three hours, apologizes, gets kidnapped, rescued, banged, the end. Some master baiters might argue for boobs as a metaphor to trigger pages of responses, but I don't think there's a single redeeming factor of this subplot. Everything about it is off, much like the other scene that got a lot of attention at launch, and it stands out because the rest of Metro Last Light's universe is presented so authentically. It acknowledges humanity's evil without being completely nihilistic. It's a dark, gritty, and disturbing world, yet beautiful and hopeful at the same time. If Last Light's goal was to allow anyone to immerse themselves in this world, then it more than succeeded. While abandoning some of 2033's intensity, its improved characterization and presentation make up for some of the losses. And one thing was for certain. Last Light ended the doubt of Eastern developers and their ability to create AAA titles that appeal to a global audience. Last Light's marketing, presentation, and craft didn't just meet the ability of the West. It surpassed them. As mentioned before, THQ previously demanded that multiplayer and co-op be featured in Last Light, and obviously that didn't happen. But one seventh generation trend did slip through the cracks. The season pass. Granted, it was $5 less than THQ's own pass for Saints Row III, but it certainly wasn't off to a good start when Deep Silver took over. Our are they charging money for this? Yep. Ranger Mode, the fan favorite of 2033's hardcore players, was made into a pre-order bonus. Deep Silver caused a storm just weeks before the game had released. And it wasn't long until the company had to explain that pre-order bonuses were required by retail. And not wanting to exclude missions in the campaign, Ranger Mode seemed the most sensible thing as most new players wouldn't want to touch it anyways. One thing worth mentioning that doesn't get brought up nearly enough is that Metro 2033 also charged money for the same mode on Xbox 360. It makes sense why the publisher thought this was the best case scenario, and depressingly, it kind of was. There's no way that cutting levels from an exclusively single-player narrative-driven FPS would be less controversial. Deep Silver were going to take a bullet and decide to lose a toe rather than a foot. Now, I've played the DLC content before, but only in the Redux pack for a review, and to be honest, it only got one mention in a paragraph. No analysis was made of its contents. And considering the rest of my coverage has been done with past experiences for reference, for the sake of consistency, it'd probably be best to do the same for the DLC. But in order to do that, I'd need someone else who's more familiar with the franchise than I am. Almost got it. There? There? Yeah, there we go. I'm here to briefly talk about the DLC for Metro Last Light. It's a very mixed bag. So rather than going through them chronologically, I'm going to go through them in an order of ascending personal interest. That means I start with the bad one. The tower is best described as being unfortunate. It's unfortunate that resources were spent making it in the first place, unfortunate to look at, and of course unfortunate to play. 
The premise is that you're testing on a virtual combat simulator. You fight through enemies and build up a score while doing so. The tower makes me think of a bad pop song, a song that's sampling the worst Mass Effect DLC ever made. In the first level, you fight waves of enemies who come out of two doorways. They're right there. When enemies make it into the level, they open up more monster closets for their friends to come out of. More men coming out of the closet means you die faster, so you camp the doorways. If that sounds completely dull and mindless, well, it's because it is. It's more difficult than it looks, especially on Ranger Hardcore, and there's very little room for strategy. Most of my creativity came from putting down claymores which make the Morrowind hit sound. When promoting the DLC, developers said they made it with the intention of showing off the combat in Last Light. They felt the campaign didn't show it off enough since you could stealth through nearly every encounter. The first impressions of this are just terrible. You kill people coming out of a hallway, and then wait for the next wave. Then you do it again. For something so simple, it's surprisingly unpolished as well. At one point, I was in danger of being overwhelmed. I panicked, my caveman brain turned on, and I began to spam the G button for grenade. In the Metro games, that just puts on your gas mask, but something happened. What? So it has an I win button. Huh. When you beat a level, you unlock new weapons and get to choose settings for the next level. These are sometimes better than the first level. Since the mutants don't carry guns, I found fighting them a lot easier than fighting the human beings. They continue to spawn at only one side of the room, and you can stop them from making new entrances. Rather than getting harder, the game gets easier. When you kill an enemy, you get some military ammo. In the first level, you could, well, buy more ammo. Now you can buy allies and more weapons. There's a small glimmer of what could have been having a Metro Nazi Zombies kind of game mode. Here it's not well thought out, not well balanced, and not well polished. When you finally beat Pinnacle Station, they say, good job. Honestly, after playing it, you shouldn't be expecting a lot by this point. Next DLC. The developer pack is a two-parter. It's pretty alright. In fact, I wouldn't call any DLC besides the tower downright bad. There's a little museum of the developers, which is interesting. There's also a gallery of NPCs and enemies. So if you ever wanted a closer look at those, now you can. There's a shooting gallery that has a few challenges. Then you have the arena. This also has combat challenges, but you can also make the AI fight to amuse you. Good people of Cyrodiil! Welcome to the Imperial City Arena! These are just some fun extras. It feels like stuff you would unlock in other games, but here it's a standalone DLC. I get the impression the developers might have thought so too. So they also included a standalone mission. A spookier one. Enter the Spider Lair. This one has you playing as a stalker off for a treasure hunt. Things don't go as planned. You awaken to find yourself trapped in a nest of spider bugs. You're completely unarmed, and they're everywhere. Your objective is simple enough. Escape the spiders. If you're an arachnophobe, this mission is your personal hell. You're trapped with thousands of spiders and have very little supplies. Initially, the only thing that can drive them back is light, whether it's from the environment or from a headlamp. If you've played the main game, you've encountered them already. The twist is that since you aren't as well armed as before, you have to rely on the light. This is tricky with a lot of spiders. Relying only on light to fight enemies, kind of like Alan Wake, is a neat idea. Eventually, though, you do get some weapons, which includes a flamethrower. Now, I'm not against sending Charlotte and her children into the Abyss. In fact, I encourage it. However, I do think the light mechanic had a lot of potential. Trying to find ways to get around enemies by using pulses of lights or patterns could have been interesting. Even so, they might not have had a lot of room to do something with it, since the DLC is only around a half an hour or so long. It's still a solid addition trying to survive and scavenge in a very oppressive area. If you're playing in a ranger mode, you'll still need to be conserving a lot to get out. It's a decent challenge, and definitely worth the small amount of time it takes to play it. Besides, it's a cathartic flamethrower. Yeah. The Chronicles pack is a three-parter. It includes three missions, each one centered around a different character. You've got Pavel, Khan, and Anna. Each mission is perfectly appropriate for the character. Anna's mission is a direct tie into Last Light. It's the mission where Artyom goes to kill the Dark One, but now you play as her. It plays out very similarly, except now you kill about 10,000 more mutants. You also go after Artyom, fruitlessly trying to save him from the Nazis. It's a really gorgeous and atmospheric section, but it is very short. In fact, I beat the entire mission in under 10 minutes, and I wasn't trying to rush it. It also goes from day to night in a few seconds, which is very odd. So, it's very nice looking, woefully underdeveloped, and poorly paced, much like Anna as a character. As for Pavel, he's escaping capture as usual. The beginning is mainly focused on stealth and has some fun opportunities for little things. You can ruin a dinner, have a drink, and up the stakes in a Russian roulette game. You do have the option of going loud, but you'll miss out on a lot. I think his mission offers more character insight than the other two. It's not substantial, but you understand why he does the things he does in the main game a little bit more. 
Once again, this mission is very short. You can probably beat it in under a half an hour. The same length goes for the con mission. This one is focused on the scary and mystical side of the metro. There are a few great set pieces, and the visuals are really striking throughout the whole thing. Unfortunately, like most of Metro John Redcorn's vision quests, you'll be stuck behind Khan for a lot of it. Ultimately, these missions are just more of the main game condensed down into a sequence. The issue is that it has maybe an hour and a half of content spread around three different characters, technically four. It's like once you start getting invested in what's happening, then it's already over. Rather than really fleshing out one character with a more substantial DLC, they've instead made three. So the further development of each character can be summed up in a loading screen fun fact. These aren't striking new revelations, just a bit more context. Context that I honestly don't think adds a lot. Focusing on one person for the DLC could have ended up with something a lot stronger. As it is, you're just playing for the sake of more game. It's well polished and well thought out, there just isn't a lot of it. So let's move on to our final DLC, the Faction Pack. It is, yet again, another three-parter. Oh boy! Another Scorcher! One of the missions has you playing as a redline sniper. In the main game, stealth is used to avoid harder combat. This time around, if the enemy raises an alarm, then it's game over. The map is a remix of the Outpost level from 2033, except now the snow has melted and it's being hit with a powerful storm. It's an incredibly atmospheric map and has some tension to it. One wrong shot can ruin you. I found this to be incredibly entertaining. Getting around the guards and traps and taking a shot when you can. Having the level being designed purely around stealth makes it interesting to play. You end up being rewarded for planning carefully and paying attention to your surroundings. Unfortunately, right when things are really getting good, it's over. This is a 15 minute mission. Alright, so let's go on to the next one. In this next one, you play as a stalker. You start in a bunker where you can buy equipment. You can unlock different suits. You get more money by going to the surface and bringing back valuable stuff. The surface is the great library. That means they're back. This mission, by itself, was my personal highlight. Unlike the other missions, which were more of the same from the main game, this had the feeling of being an experiment, like 4A was dipping a toe into where they might want the series to go in. In the mission, you travel up to the surface and find these rare and valuable objects to bring back down. There's a catch in that you can only hold five of these at a time, so you need to make multiple trips. There isn't just one way from the bunker to the surface. The map is interconnected and you can find new shortcuts of getting up or down. A grate might be closed off from your side, but after some exploration, you find the way to open it up. The rangers have restored the power grid, so you can also take light bulbs. This gives the ability to mark your pathways and figure out where you've been. It also gives you a feeling of helping to restore civilization. Sure, it's just a light bulb and the stuff you're collecting is far more valuable, but there's something about lighting up the dark corners of the runes that make you feel better about it. You find a closed doorway, find a new path, then you open it up. These shortcuts are always satisfying to find, and it's due to the difficulty. It's simple. If you're on the surface, you're not going to save. In fact, there's only one way to save. You go back to a save station inside the bunker. If anything happens to you, you come back here. So if you die on the surface, you lose all the things you've found and all the paths that you've made. This makes the game incredibly tense. There's not going to be an autosave if you enter some new grand area. It makes you feel vulnerable for the whole trip there and back. Taking a risk can cost a lot of time. You can't count on the underground being safe either. What might seem like the end of a surface run turns into your biggest challenge yet. Oh no. There's a lot more freedom to use your own playstyle. If you have a bigger gun, you can brave bigger bad boys. You could buy a radiation suit to go through different shortcuts. Exploring a dangerous interconnected world like this is just fantastic. A dangerous scavenger hunt is such a simple idea, but it's executed so well. It's not completely open world, but it's more freedom than the series ever had at this point. It's a miniature version of what an expanded game with a setup might look like. Add new areas to explore, more player upgrades, etc. It's a damn good idea, and most bizarrely of all, this is the first DLC the game came out with. They followed this up with the tower. You can likely beat it in around two hours, but it's a great time. What else was there? Oh right, the third mission. You play as a Nazi gunner. You kill waves of pig dog reds for about 10 minutes, and that's it. So it's basically a turret section. All the DLC is bundled in Redux anyways, so it's not like people can choose anything. Wait, what? <laughs> Why did I do this? I'm not ranking them or anything or dividing them into pizza slices. I, I don't know. Ray, why did I do this? When editing Mass Effect years later, I was building the series up to make the final point that the franchise had never truly peaked and that the universe always equipped the games themselves. What shocked me about the making of this video is how much my preconceived notions were shattered to reach a similar conclusion. 
Metro 2033 is a game I finally come to appreciate as a middle market darling it always was, in spite of its myriad of issues. And Last Light is no longer the textbook sequel I once believed it to be, nor does the Redux offer every possible experience to players. But also, just like Mass Effect, neither entry excelling in gameplay isn't a disappointment because it's the world that makes them so compelling. On its own, that sounds like a dismissal of 4A games and putting the weight of this franchise's success purely on Dmitry Glukovsky, and that's not my intent. The author deserves credit for providing his blueprint to this small Ukrainian studio, but a plan's only as good as the people acting on it. The challenges of realizing a world people have never seen outside of their imagination has crippled creative people for centuries, and will continue to do so. Yet, in an art form that Ukraine didn't have an industry for just 10 years prior to 4A's foundation, came an adaptation powerful enough to captivate the local readers, global players, and the author himself. And whatever challenges the games may face, be it gameplay, development, or publishing, it's that dedication which will always bring people back to this apocalypse. One filled with disease, disaster, and despair, but with a reason to keep going. I thought covering both games in one video would make it easier to release this before Exodus came out. Obviously, that didn't happen. I mishandled my schedule, the project grew, and I just hope the result was worth it for you, the viewers. This video is without a doubt the most collaborative I've made, and it's important to highlight those who assisted. Firstly, one of my dearest friends, Osage, who kindly used their native tongue to translate the Russian interviews. Super Bunny Hop, who kindly narrated one of the developer quotes which as a fan of his content long before doing YouTube full-time, was awesome. Hayden, who's appeared on my Twitter several times for his utterly hilarious content that's currently the best he's done. If you enjoy the dramatic recreations of Dean's GSC days, you'll love his latest videos. Along with our mutual friend Nick, who also voiced one of the developer's quotes. He's been writing, narrating, and filming for years, and those with connections, give him a ring. And last but the opposite of least, Mandalore. Not only did he take a huge weight off my shoulders covering the DLC with far more charm than I ever could, he was also instrumental in this video's pre-production process. But this goes without saying, check out his content. He's one of the best on the platform and just made an excellent video about getting started on YouTube. Your current indie game obsession, Beat Saber. Best Mass Effect class, according to Andromeda, Engineer. Would you consider doing a Years Later series on the Gears of War or Fallout games you've played? Definitely not Gears, as I've never been a big fan of the franchise. I don't dislike it, I own all the games except Judgment, and have enjoyed their multiplayer with friends, but never really sank my teeth into them. They served as a break from Halo and Call of Duty back in the day for me. As for Fallout, the third game's the only one I've played for a decent amount of time. I've been meaning to give New Vegas another shot this year, so we'll see how that goes. But if Fallout's covered, it probably won't be a Years Later. What's your New Year's resolution? Make more content? Yeah, I don't have much help either. Do you plan on reading the Metro novels? Already tried, and the translated novel was so clunky in its writing I couldn't get past the opening chapters. Which, after delving more into the game's plot, is really a shame because there's some amazingly cool factions, locations, and set pieces. Do you plan on reading any of the Stalker books, including Roadside Picnic? If it's got a good translation like Battle Royale does, sure. Has anime ended yet? It's only allowed to end when Black Lagoon does. Hero, where's my contents? Do you do parties? My enthusiasm's infectious. Are games getting better? I don't know. I'm still having a blast. Dad, when are you coming back from that milk run? It's been 10 years. I'm busy!